Okay, this is a lesson for Landmark Baptist Church about open theism. It's a lesson for open theists. Some of you may have appropriated that phrase. You hear it. We can't help it. We're now uh, aware of everything discussed on the planet through the internet, web-based learning modules, websites, online platforms like YouTube, Facebook. So as you hear these things, the first lesson will be is to remind you as a pastor of one of the Lord's New Testament churches, the Bible words, we support those. Believe means support. We don't use the Bible to support something we construct between our ears. For example, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, a brilliant apologist, unsurpassed in his scholarship, he said that he had spent approximately seven years studying God's uh, omniscience in relationship to man's free will. Now, I don't, I didn't hear him define free will according to the Bible, causal agency in the hip field stem. And for those who would accuse you, and they will, landmark, you need to know that's all there. They do is accuse. They put you in a category. So. If you say anything about free will that's not libertarian, which they're expecting libertarianism or compatibilism, and if you say anything about free will as a, an advocate, that is, if you're leading out from a text, it, it won't occur to them that you know hifil or hafal, the causative stems in the Hebrew language. Now, I don't mean you know the grammar, you've studied the Hebrew, but you've been told. Uh, so just tell them you're a hifilite. Uh, because every time someone who doesn't read the Bible accuses me, for example, as a pastor, first it's charming when they say I don't believe in free will it's because they don't support free will. They just say it. It's a sound barely uh, coming out of their mouth. It certainly didn't come from their brain. They just picked it up and held it as long as they could so they could accuse someone. But for William Lane Craig to say that God's all-knowingness is a fact, and it is, who would question what God knew and how would we uh, know to do that? So we just say exclusive, all-inclusive, everything in absolute, which is now we don't have to say anything. But he said after seven years, he concluded that God's knowledge of everything was not did not find it necessary. That is, an individual can't say, because God knew I would do something wrong, let's just cut to the chase, that I had of necessity to do that. That's great. That is wonderful that he took seven years to do that. So what I would ask open theists, uh, and I would ask even people who say they're closed, where did you get the word open? And why did you, the word adjective is from the word add and Latin is to throw, and the adjective part is also from Latin, and the idea is near or alongside something. So we threw this word alongside, but what made us toss that word open to it? It's almost as if we couldn't have come up with a more antithetical term, which seems to be the pattern, especially landmark I've taught you numerous times to notice that none of these things that appear to be irreconcilable are ever anywhere close to the other. It's always far, far removed. It's similar to pre or post trib. You couldn't even entertain a conversation about mid anyway. And if you try to say pre wrath, that just bores people. So sustain the fight. Anything but a New Testament church will. Everyone but a pastor will. So those of us that our ambassadors for Christ, pastors of his churches, we're feeding sheep, we're remembering and always mindful that these are parents of children that want to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. These are people who are, as even C.S. Lewis said, we're living in a live world. So he was close. But just to uh, remind you, they have these little, uh, they call these things cell phone devices, but you can get this Bible app, the Wave Bible app. Very useful, by the way. So I typed in all these words, you know, open God, close God, and nothing nothing appeared. But if you type in living, 
God, living God, and you push search, well, there's 30 occurrences just in the King James Version. So the, the first question to ask yourself, as especially as a body member of one of the Lord's New Testament churches, and certainly we're not here to support fallible religious constructs, and I'm certainly not here to spend seven years to say and draw a conclusion that the astute scholar William Lane Craig, Dr. William Lane Craig, a man that uh, I have great respect for, it took him seven years to conclude that God knowing you would do something did not necessitate it. Well, the dilemma between open and closed theism is not the outcome. The outcome is the same. If you talk to an open theist, they said, well, God looked down the corridors of time and noticed who would believe on his son, and therefore uh, he made provision for those, and those are his elect and or they're his believers, and he sent his son to die for them. Well, it is true that John 3.16 says everyone who believeth in him, well, it's everyone who's already believing. And it's also true in John 20, 31, that that itself was written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that as one who uh, is believing after being born again, you're now a believer, the Bible says. You're now a one who is believing, always believing. You have life through his name. Well, that's also a deliberative subjunctive in John 20, 31. So you deliberately believed based on what you read and heard or heard from the gospel, those contextualized attesting miracles and those contextualized narratives, if you will, those verbal environments in which those attesting miracles were arranged and properly contextualized and strategically placed there as ordained means to lead people to Christ. So that is to be willing to cause deliberately oneself to trust, support that Jesus is the Christ. So we have all the evidence and it is causal. So the outcome, if you listen to both sides, neither of them have an outcome that's improved by their assertion. Uh, people will say, yes, more people will go to hell and God knew that before he ever created man. Well, how does that solve the equation? Well, it doesn't. Uh, determinists will say God foreknew and that was a uh, relational knowledge, even though the people he foreknew did not exist, it's all in the mind of God. But the outcome's no different. There are no more people come to Christ through that deterministic construct. It's rather full attribution to God. Well, on the other side, they say, well, you're saying God is the reason why people die and go to hell. Well, both sides say that. <clears throat> both sides say that God already knew that people would reject his son, and yet he created them anyway. And now we're just arguing over uh, to whom would we make the attribution. Some say it's an accusation against God to say that he sent someone to hell. But the Bible doesn't say, for example, double predestination where God then, uh, the doctrine of reprobation, that God deliberately prevented someone from coming to his son. That's nowhere in the scriptures. God never had to predetermine someone uh, to go to hell. That's not in the scriptures. But back to the open theist, or even the closed theist, calling the, re the reality of the situation reprobation or double predestination doesn't change the outcome. So as a pastor one of the Lord's New Testament churches, the only person we see interested in involving himself in the affairs of men we have in the Old Testament, God deliberately speaking with his prophet Moses, speaking about miracles. Now tie that to the Gospel of John, which says these miracles that were previously mentioned in that chapter reference these miracles, these things, it's referring to these attesting miracles, have been written and remain on record, perfect tense. That is, they continue to, are still with us today. We call that an extant doctrine, still here, for us to know that these miracles are for us to, by those miracles, attesting miracles in their contextualized narratives, cause ourselves to believe. And he spoke with Moses and would tell Moses a particular miracle to perform. And he said, maybe this will, this then will find them 
willing to cause themselves to believe. So God, either that happened or not. So you can anthropomorph it away or anthropath it away, which is irrelevant. The question is, was God through a prophet intending to be causal indirectly of people? Well, of course he was. And God did inbreak into time and space and miracles were, which were uh, phenomenal things happening to matter for which no, uh, within time, space, and matter uh, source could be assigned. How were miracles not forces of what we call applying to natural things and contradicting natural laws? Well, we caused ourselves to believe and attribute those workings to God. So God's intervening and God's uh, God was faithful then and God's faithful now. He's a living, the living God. A living, not open, not closed. Both of those are unsatisfactory. And yes, at least C.S. Lewis said live world. He was close. And an article in a psychology journal, which was uh, well-renowned, incredible, was saying, well, of course you don't have free will, but live as though you do. They came so close. Uh, to identifying the phenomenon of life living. So you don't need to exhaust yourself as Dr. William Lane Craig did, which that's his field. He's in the academia, the world of academia. So that is his interest to exhaust himself in resources and studies. And in the religious field, they will always construct their own adjectives. They'll toss these words next to God and then on they go with their antithetical banter, but you, for example, as a parent, uh, my grandson's now up here. He's my fifth grandchild and first grandson. He's made it to the wall, and but he won't be entertaining such things as open or closed theism. He, he will be taught to search out these phrases, living God, living in true God, for example. Those occur in the Bible as well. And search that out and look at those contexts and respect the living God who is contemporaneous with his creation in uh, constantly lording, watching, carrying out the future. So nothing really is outside the uh, kingship of the Godhead. Nothing, there's not even variables afforded men to do something that would violate the parameters of being a creature. We, we're we already limited. We're already time, space, and matter bound. Uh, we're, we're even described in more of a polite manner, euphemistically, to dwell in earthen vessels. Uh, we are dirt, dust of the earth, if you will. Scientists say stardust, which really doesn't help. <laughs> it's still a very earthy reality. So yes, we pray to God knowing that he hears us today. We know that he has no limits on altering, changing, interjecting, modifying anything. And we also know just from the simplistic uh, level of expressions of logic, uh, I've shown you all before at Landmark, especially in classes, where it's this is not a phenomenon that can't be expressed in a branch of theology the root word math for disciple, that word math, for example, where we can diagrammatically express two plus two equals four, for example, nothing changes that. But we can rewrite that in an infinite number of ways and it'd still be the same. So if you're struggling with the phenomenon, how can something remain the same and occur and present itself in an infinite number of ways well, you wouldn't be impressed with that in elementary algebra. You would, you learn that very quickly. Eventually, you even learn to place a symbol for all real numbers, or the solution is all real numbers, because you can't provide all those solutions. You just give a symbol for any all real numbers solve this equation, which means it can be rewritten in an infinite number of ways, and it's still the same. So one is the determinate reality of it, and the other one would be the desired reality of it. So no, you're not left out. Your children aren't abandoned to some decree where God said, no, they may not come to him. Uh, 
whatever you hear, all that. That's when people prefer to support their fallible religious constructs and posit outwardly from the text. The authority of God's word says God is the living God. It says we're a living soul. Uh, the Bible shows God uh, constantly uh, sending a messenger, sending prophets, as in John 6, when he spoke to those who presumed to not come to him. And he said that no one would come to him except the Father who sent him. Draw him. And then he went on to explain that you all had already rejected the message from the prophets because he said those who uh, listen, that is, learn from them, will come to him. So you'll always find that people who reject the gospel, that is the cause of their, uh, if you will, loss of all that God otherwise intended for them. Similar to Luke chapter 7, landmark, as I remind you, that when people say, well, nothing can thwart the determinate counsel of God, that's absolutely correct. That's all set, just like two plus two is four, but it can be rewritten in an infinite number of ways. Luke chapter seven says that they negated the counsel of God unto themselves, that word boule, unto themselves. That's the great qualifier. So if you cause yourself to disbelieve, you deliberately did that, that'd be deliberative action, causal on your part. You rejected the gospel. You rejected the Messiah who came to die for the sins of his people. You didn't undo what Jesus came to accomplish. You nullified it under yourself. So you can stand before him and hear him say, depart from me. He'll call you a worker of iniquity. And he'll say he never at any former time knew you. Because had he ever known you, you would always be one being known by him. And if you need God to be responsible for your unbelief, then That'll only work in this lifetime because he won't take responsibility for it in the next. If you need to modify his message and add to the faith of Christ, his faithfulness, uh, which Galatians 2.16 says, those who believe into Jesus are declared right out from the faithfulness of Christ, his faith. And that includes his obedience unto death, even the death of the cross, which no one, landmark, no one of us, not even one of us were ever asked to be the lamb from God. We were never chosen, as the Bible says, that Jesus is his elect one to go and be the offering. None of us ever fulfilled all righteousness. We are not even capable of it. And we don't even want to do it. We wouldn't even calculate. I've asked people, have you ever calculated the number of sins if 613 law codes stand on record? And they do. And the number of ways you could break those with your heart, mind, soul, body, and your strength, because we're asked to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, even give our bodies as a living sacrifice to him. So you can just take the five ways of any one of the given law codes and begin to multiply that out. And if you think of the 108 billion people on the planet and the infraction, that is the 108 billion that have lived to date approximately on this planet, and the number of infractions against that 613 law code. And yet Jesus' death, his willingness to substitute himself for our sins, not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, is still was sufficient to satisfy his Father, to fulfill all righteousness, all the demands of the law, to fulfill the law, not just keep it, he fulfilled the law, and satisfy his Father. So we don't have any... Um, ground or cause or case in the Bible to reject the living God. Uh, We do well to contemplate the implications of that and to acknowledge him because the tragedy would be for a closed theist to say, well, the living God doesn't factor into the equation or an open theist, which is what this is about. Oh, that doesn't factor in. But if you decide to be an open theist to go and battle closed theism, you might want to, why don't you just choose a Bible word? But I think landmark as I've taught you If there's no uh, ability to merchandise men in it, if there's no commercial interest held by it, then who really wants to introduce the Bible into the equation? Especially when the Bible is so much, what's not even comparable to the low grade of thought of finite men. So finite arguments are according to dead constructs and that sustains a necessary friction to, I guess, cause the only interest people have, which is to banter, ridicule, contentiously contend, berate, deride, and all those other negative things the Bible 
uh, teaches us to come out from. So that's the lesson on open theism first. Ask yourself, where did we come up with that word? <laughs> it's not in the Bible. It's not an attribute of God, just like closed. It's, it's not a Bible word. So when we just go so far down that road, and these dear souls, we, we're, we'll be seeing more and more come our way. They expect us to know uh, the Bible well enough to give them Bible answers, and we do, and we're honored to do that. So Landmark, enjoy this lesson, and anyone tuning in to uh, listen to the advantages we have by studying the Bible, supporting the scriptures, promoting Christ, advocating Christ. You enjoy these lessons as well, as well and you have a blessing.